Okay, so um, let, let's just kind of, uh, we'll wrap this up here by, by looking at some mathematical analysis and, and um, seeing how the, the Bohr energies that we calculated last time can be kind of recalculated this time using what we've just done, and that will actually lead us to the direct prediction of how big an atom should be. Um, and, and this is, you know, I think one of the things that amazes me are, are these theories that you just get so much information out of very simple assumptions, and this is one of them that it seems like there should be no way in hell that we should be able to calculate how big an atom is. But literally, as long as we know the fundamental constants of nature, everything we have done will allow us to very easily do that. And when I say very easily, I mean <laughs> relatively speaking. So anyway, uh, and, and I'm going to actually kind of try to, in red, number or, or letter the, the equations because there will be times when I'll say we're going to use equation 3 with equation 4 to get equation 6 or whatever. And for sake of space, yeah, okay, the way I'm going to do it, just because I have limited blackboard space, I'm going to describe in words why each one is true. I would like to write why each is true, but I'm just going to uh, say it in words instead. So putting into equation form what we just did, and this is our equation one. By saying that the circumference of a given energy level which I will write as 2 pi times Rn. And I'll just kind of diagram that here to be clear, where we have some, some however many loops. So N uh, lambdas. So that's the nth energy level. And specifically, we're asserting that, or we're calling that radius R sub N. And this is for energy level n here. So the circumference of that circle that I just drew, if we take de Broglie's hypothesis to be true, this must simply be an integer multiple of lambda. And specifically, that integer is exactly n, the same as that subscript. So this is that model that we, or this is applying de Broglie's model uh, to the Bohr atom. Backtracking a little, and I should have done this in opposite, actually, yeah. <laughs> this is how the order that I should have done it in. This would be two, this is one. The more, the more fundamental thing we said that, or De Broglie, De Broglie said that lambda, the, well, De Broglie didn't call it the De Broglie wavelength, to be very clear, but <laughs> the thing that we name after him, we, we understand to be just H over P, or H over MV. So pretty clearly, now at this point, we can combine 1 and 2 to show that 2 pi r sub n, we can write as n times h over mv. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to go back to 10. <laughs> Sorry to be all over the place here. But, and, and there's a, a specific reason why I'm, I'm writing it like that now, actually. Um, so now, let's rearrange this a little bit. And um, I, I, I'm going to do just a little bit of work here. I'm going to... I'm, I'm just going to swap the 2 pi and the momentum. So we get r sub n times p equals n times h over 2 pi. Now, before we go further, this thing is just going to pop up over and over and over the entire rest of the semester. So Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, we actually give a, a whole nother symbol for, and we call it the reduced Planck's constant. So the reduced Planck's constant uh, is h over 2 pi, which we, we define or we write as simply just h bar. It's h with little bar through the hat, through the top of it. And, and you, you pronounce it h bar. So 
if h is about 6 times 10 to the minus 34, and if 2 pi is about 6, this is actually even easier to remember. So instead of h being about, like the tilde, 10 to the minus 34, h bar is, is extremely close to like actually 1 times 10 to the minus 34. So this is very close to 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Much closer than h is itself. Um, so I'm just going to call this now an h bar. And so this won't have a, yeah, yeah, I'll say that's number three here. And I'm going to erase the board on the right because we'll need a little bit more. So much easier. So, like I said, I, I'm not going to, like, explain everything out, at least in, in words, but this, this is important enough. Um, remember that we define the angular momentum, or angmom. Uh, the angular momentum from classical physics we know to be, uh, we write it as L, and I'll just draw, draw a little kind of uh, picture here. So, imagine that you have, like, a, a turntable or something just going around in a circle. So I'll draw it like this. And that thing that's going around in a circle, and so I'm trying to draw like a plane, like a tabletop. So the thing that is moving around in a flat surface here at a given radius, and I'll draw it with vectors, at a current distance, vector distance r on that xy grid, moving with a velocity of v also on that plane, when you take r crossed with v, and I'm doing the, the right-hand rule here, r crossed with v gives an angular momentum. So in this case, if this is a flat surface, if you have a radius vector there, uh, a velocity you can't see, but a velocity vector pointing into the board or something like that, velocity vector there, the result of that, the angular momentum, L, is the cross product of those two. So all right, like this, the angular momentum of, classically speaking, is found by taking the cross product of the radius and its velocity. And for, for example, for circular motion, for uniform circular motion, which is, by the way, precisely what Bohr had assumed, um, we can assume safely that these two things are at right angles to one another. So in this case here, when I take away that vector symbol, I'm, I just mean the magnitude. So L, without that, is just the magnitude, is simply just RV. So, do we see where we're going now? How can we apply that to equation three? By the way, I'll call this equation four now. This is the equation for angular momentum for an object moving in a circle, given radius, given velocity. And I'll even be a little bit more suggestive and throw my marker. I, have, I literally just went to Target, so I have like a whole box over here now. Um, so I'm going to put a sub n. So at a given orbital level n, we'll call it r sub n. And so rather just generically talk about the angular momentum, we'll say the specific angular momentum of that orbital level is L sub n. So what I'm going to do now is simply just combine 3 and 4. And at this point, here's what we get. The left-hand side is simply just the angular momentum. We have... L sub n, and the right-hand side, after writing it with the reduced Planck constant, is n h bar. And this is a really foundationally absolute essential thing here. Because everything that I've just told you about how, how Bohr developed his model has been in exactly the reverse order from what he actually did. Uh, and I, I didn't want to let on to that at the, first at the first place. This is, in fact, 
what Bohr started from. And I kind of dislike how the majority of textbooks do this because they try to replay the historical order, which I think is just bass backwards, uh, to quote my graduate professor. If you start with this assumption, you can reproduce everything we've just done, but I like the way of doing it first, assuming de Broglie. And here's the thing. This equation is so fundamentally important because this tells us a really unique thing about the universe. So remember, just, just backtracking a little bit. This assumption here came from combining de Broglie's hypothesis with saying that the energy levels are going to be multiples of that. But what we what we said though is that um, sorry that that was our assumption. This is what we found. If you go in the reverse order, if you assume this, you work backwards and you see that those energy levels actually are going to be exact multiples of the de Broglie wavelength. The the whole point of this though, this is a cohesive theory and. It's true if one of these is true, the other is true. So what I, the way I want to describe this and the way that Bohr had described it, his fundamental assumption was that imagine angular momentum is quantized. Specifically, if, if angular momentum is a fundamental like ingredient of the universe, the same way that like energy is, the same way that, um, that, that time and space are basically, if angular momentum is quantized, which is exactly what this equation tells us. And, sorry, and let, let me extend that just a tad. This equation tells us that for any energy level of the Bohr atom, we can calculate the angular momentum of it, and it comes in perfect multiples of that weird looking letter. More precisely, for level one of the, of the hydrogen atom, if you go through this whole analysis here, which we've already done, not only does the Bohr, sorry, not only does the de Broglie wavelength perfectly link up, but more fundamentally, it does so because the angular momentum of that energy level is exactly one h bar. Applying it to level two, if you have exactly two of those little wavelengths that that intersect, the second energy level, if you want to analyze the angular momentum of that second level. Turns out the energy, the, the angular momentum is two h bars. And they are precisely the same thing. If you assume one, the other has to be true, which I think is kind of cool. You can go back this way or you can go this way. Um, but the, the, the fundamental assumption that, that Bohr, in fact, did make of the universe was he said, imagine angular momentum comes in quantized packets. And more specifically, the, the lowest amount of angular momentum the universe ever allows for is this. This is the minimum amount of angular momentum the universe will ever allow. And that's that to me, again, that, that's a really hard thing to, to consider. Just like energy. Energy comes in individual packets or individual like smallest possible denominations. Same with angular momentum you have a minimum amount of angular momentum, which is h bar. The next allowable amount of angular momentum anything can possibly have is two h bars. The next possible angular momentum is three h bars. And what we're doing is we are building up the Bohr atom by saying, here is angular momentum. Let's calculate all this other stuff. So let me, let me write that. I, I, I hope I'm, I, I hope that that statement isn't lost on you, though, because that is a fundamentally important groundbreaking decision, or not decision, but, but reality, that you can't have less than that amount of angular math. Uh, I, I text message lingo, I need to define that between. So angular momentum can only ever come in quantities, quantized integer multiples of h bar, like that. And actually, I'm thinking that is a good place to stop here. Um, yeah, let, let's stop here. And I think what we'll, what we'll do the next time, instead of trying to cram that much more into here, um, I think I'd rather just take a, take a breather, and we'll begin next time directly with the calculation of exactly what the energy levels are of the Bohr atom. And, and that's where we're going to calculate the, the radius, the, the, 
the radius for level one, the radius for level two and whatnot. Um, but I think this is kind of a, a good you know, ending point because we've seen the first bit of simply just trusting our mathematics to get some really cool result here. So 